Hear these words from Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of the maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Good morning to all of you and welcome to this time of worship here at College Mennonite Church. Today, we begin a, our summer worship series that we are calling Short Stories by Jesus. We're going to dive into Jesus' parables this summer and all the beauty and the complexity that they hold. For some of us, these stories will be very familiar, and we might be tempted to think that we kind of know the direction of these stories and where they're going and we, that we have them all figured out. Some of us may hear some of these stories for the very first time and be intrigued or confused. And likely all of us will be confused by these stories at some point because there are many layers, many layers to a parable that give it depth and meaning and beauty. And so I invite you to enter into these parables, into this summer series with your whole being. And our call to worship helps us with that. Our call to worship mentions different parts of our physical bodies, and so as you hear those named, I invite you to touch them or move them in some way. So join me in our call to worship. Open our ears to hear your word. Open our eyes to see your presence. Open our arms to embrace of the community. Open our minds to the beauty of truth. Open our hearts to the joy of new life. Please join in singing together in Purple Voices Together book number 764, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. And we will sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5.
today we have the opportunity to celebrate with uh, high school graduates from our congregation. So I invite them to come forward at this time. Come on up from various places around the room. Most of them are here. Others are traveling on family trips or are preparing for their ceremonies this morning. So come on, come on up here in front of the table. I'll step down. So this morning we have Alex Bermundez, Michaela Schwarzendruber, Cormac Coop Lichty, Kent Bailey, and Nelly Robles. And our other graduates uh, not here are um, Carlos Lichty, Diego Marino, and Carmen Marino. So graduates, congratulations. Today, we as a congregation join you in celebrating the completion of high school and recognizing that you are at a time of gaining independence as you end your teenage years. God has been at work in your lives, and we have seen that happen as you have grown physically, emotionally, academically, and spiritually. And today, we as a church recognize and thank God for the unique glimpse of God that we see in each of you. We've watched you grow and mature, and we are excited for the continued development that God has for each of you. We all care very deeply about you, and we will continue to pray for you as you enter into this next phase of life and cheer you on into this next chapter. So as a token of recognizing who you are and who you are becoming, we want to give you your own copy of the new Voices Together hymnal. This is a source of song and scripture and art that has been a part of God's people telling about God's faithfulness throughout many generations. It helps us direct our attention to God in times of joy and in times of sorrow. And as you now start new adventures, wherever they may be, we hope that this hymnal continues to be a source of guidance and direction and encouragement and comfort as you seek God in all of life. And this gift is from the entire congregation. It's not just from a couple of us or just us as pastors. Um, and so, having said that, it's not quite ready for you yet. This gift is still being prepared. So I invite all of you, College Mennonite Church, to you know, discreetly look through the Voices Together hymnal during the service this morning and find your favorite song or scripture passage in the back or call to worship or prayer, whatever that might be, and be ready then to mark the specific hymnals for these graduates uh, after the worship service. They are out underneath the canopy, and this is a way that we can bless them as a community um, with this unique gift from us as a congregation to them. And don't worry, I will deliver the completed gift later this week to you, so you will get it, don't worry. You can also find more about each of these graduates in today's prayer email that, email that went out. There's a little more about them and some pictures there as well. So to close uh, this, this time and this recognition, this time of blessing, please join me in a prayer of blessing for these young adults, and I invite you to extend a hand of blessing to them. Loving and nurturing God, we thank you for the gift of life that we have known through Kent, Alex, Cormac, Carlos, Diego, Carmen, Nelly, and Michaela. God, as they look ahead and only see a broad outline of what their future might hold, May they see you and find you in the details as you shape them to be who you have created them to be. We commit them to your care, God. May they go in confidence that nothing can separate them from your love. And give them generous hearts to share your love with others. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to each of you in this new chapter of life. You may be seated. <laughs> Definitely something to celebrate. As humanity relates to God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, 
Prayer is as vital as the air that we breathe. We can be grateful that we can share in this vital practice together. Among the many we pray for today, we remember Billy Muntunkwanka and family as Lucy died peacefully at Goshen Hospital on Wednesday evening of this week. We remember Richard Kaufman um, and his brother-in-law's family, Willard Martin, who was a former member of CMC as Willard died on May 28th in Pennsylvania. And also Madeline Maldonado's nephew, Albert, and his family, as he recently has been diagnosed with cancer and will undergo a biopsy tomorrow. Albert is just 28. Please join with me in bringing these heartfelt concerns along with others before God in prayer. Eternal and loving God, conceiver and shaper, ruler and savior of the world, we bless you that awake and aware we are free to praise you. Bound in the family of Christ to worshipers in every land, we offer our prayers to you as do others around the world. We are grateful to be a part of the pattern and purpose of your kingdom. God, be merciful to us. Liberate each of us and all who follow Christ from narrowness of vision and limited discipleship. Make us keen to serve you in both private and public spheres, in our families and friendships, in our business, education, law, politics, industry, and wherever the welfare of humanity may be uplifted or threatened. Fill us with compassion and justice inform us. God, be merciful to us. Comfort us in our mourning. Encourage us in our suffering. Guide us in our healing. Hear us in our calling out. Increase our faith. Remind us that we are not alone. Enfold each one in your loving and steadfast care. God, we especially lift to you Lucy's family. Continue to enfold them and uplift them with your comfort. We give thanks that Wanda Newbury and Don Metzler-Smith are experiencing healing and progress following surgery. Enfold Willard's family and friends in your care. And God, enfold Albert and his family in prayer as they grapple with his cancer diagnosis and prepare for his biopsy tomorrow. Give wisdom and strength. We also ask you to continue to guide and sustain Pastors David and Madeline, as they travel and minister, as they meet with a pastor contact in Argentina, guide that brief time together and bolster up this pastor ministering in very difficult circumstances in Argentina. God, be merciful to all of us. Throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout our lives, enliven our minds, open our hearts to the needs of the world, inspire our connections and conversations, 
inform our decisions and protect those we love. Hear all these prayers and those also held in silence, made in the presence and in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. In el nombre de Jesús, amen. I invite families to come forward at, to the circle as we sing together, Voices Together, number 32, God Welcomes All. Good morning to all of you who are here and all of you who are there. Glad to have all of you with us. We have a story today about a family. And this family, whoop, I don't have to hold them up. This family is the Project family. So this is Grandma Project. This is Daddy Project. And the children are Sammy and Casey. The Project family likes to do uh, projects together, thus their very creative name, the Project Family. So it's just kind of their thing to do these projects. And the tradition is that at the end of Project Day, they celebrate its completion with, yes, ice cream. Well, today their project is getting the garden planted. Now, Grandma is the master gardener. Grandma knows which plants will grow in this climate and which ones should be started with seed or maybe purchased from a greenhouse. She knows when the moon is right for planting which things and what time of day to plant them and how far apart the rows should be. So Grandma's job is organizing this family project and designing the garden. Well, Casey loves to work in the soil. So Casey gets to dig. Yes, Casey gets to dig the holes and put the seeds in them and then cover them up and um, get the soil ready for planting, maybe put some castings on it. Casey is really good at doing that stuff and knowing like just how much to till the soil to make it really help those seeds grow well and those plants go, grow well and she's really good at getting everything watered once it's planted as well. And then there's Daddy and Daddy um, is really good at taking care of everyone. So he comes around with drink breaks and he makes lunch and snack for everyone and his job is also reminding everyone to put on sunscreen and to take care of bruises and cuts and those kinds of things that happen along the way. And then there is, who's the last one? Do you remember the name? Sammy. Sammy, that's right. So gardening is not Sammy's thing. There are plenty of other projects that Sammy would rather do, but it's family project day and so Sammy has been told to help Casey carry out Grandma's design. That doesn't work very well. Sammy watches everyone else while they work and steps on plants and digs holes where they aren't supposed to be and in general is just the opposite of helpful. Casey, as you can imagine, is very annoyed. At the end of the day, though, the garden is planted. Casey is really proud of the work. Casey points out the neat rows of plants. 
And Grandma is proud of her beautiful design. And Daddy is proud that no one got a sunburn and is fed and hydrated. And Sammy looks at the garden and says, oops. Sammy says, I don't have anything to be proud of. I didn't help this family project happen. I'm sorry. Sammy regrets being the opposite of helpful. And they all go get ice cream. Yep. So, do you think that Sammy deserved that ice cream? <laughs> I'm getting a lot of no's here. How do you think that, that Casey might have felt about Sammy getting that ice cream? Mad? Yeah, oh, those are some good noises and faces. <laughs> yeah. That's maybe a little bit how the disciples felt when they heard the story that Jesus told about a Pharisee and a tax collector. We're going to hear that story soon. Jesus told a lot of interesting stories that we call parables. Parables are meant to kind of make us scratch our heads and go, huh? Kind of like you all looked at me like I was nuts when I ended the story with, and then they all went and got ice cream. Parables help us ask questions. They help us wrestle with what it means to be the people of God. And they sometimes make us a little uncomfortable. So get ready for that this summer. Let's pray together. God, thank you for loving us always. When we are the opposite of helpful, you still love us, and you encourage us to do better next time. You are a merciful God. Help us ask great questions and keep learning more and more about what it means to follow Jesus. Amen. So our preacher for today is Phil Waite, our pastoral team leader. Please join me in a prayer of blessing for Phil and for us. God of love, may the words of Phil's mouth and the meditations of our hearts lead us into the beauty and the depth of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Que la gracia y la paz de Dios sean Sean con ustedes, grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good to see many of you that I haven't seen in a long time. It's just really encouraging to see, see uh, many new faces. Um, welcome to this, to this space. It's, it's encouraging. And isn't it great to hear the sound of children running on the balcony? Did you ever think that you were going to enjoy that sound as much as you're enjoying that sound? Um, yeah, that's worth, that's worth some applause. Our scripture this morning is uh, from Luke chapter 18. It is a parable beginning in verse 9. Jesus tells the parable. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to, to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Taxes. Uh, I, I heard uh, this, uh, this week or the week before about a proposal from a politician. In our, this, is, this is current, so current events here in our, in our time. And this politician proposed that the endowments, the very, very large endowments of prestigious universities be taxed to support uh, an apprenticeship program, a national apprenticeship program. Now, this is a, a, a big deal because these, inst these institutions are nonprofit organizations and they don't, they don't pay taxes. So this would be, uh, this would, would be a fairly significant uh, shift in tax policy. Now, I don't know what you think about that. I'm not even sure what I think about it. I do think it's an interesting conversation, uh, potentially a lively conversation. Uh, several years ago, when tax policy shifted, one of the things that was in play was the prospect of taxing a, a, a unique benefit that employees of, say, for example, Goshen College receive. So, uh, Beth, my wife Beth, works for Goshen College, has benefits from Goshen College, and our son is a student here. And it turns out that that's, gives us a pretty nice benefit. A pretty, it's a, it's, it's a it's pretty, pretty, pretty healthy raise in pay, as it were, for our household. And this proposal was that that particular benefit, it was very, very narrowly focused on that particular benefit, would be taxed, would, would count as income, and we'd have to claim it as income on our taxes, and we would pay taxes on it. Well, needless to say, I had strong feelings about that. Not surprisingly. If you're looking for a lively conversation with a group of strangers, talk about taxes. Bring up tax policy. In, 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 one of the things that, there's, there's some things about tax policy that really irk me, that are, that are, that are really kind of justice issues. I, I puzzle at why we don't have a national conversation about the relatively low tax on capital gains. If you are a very wealthy person um, sitting in your yacht, living off of investments, you pay less, a lower tax rate than somebody who makes money working. In a country that values hard work and labor, why do we tax it at such a higher, much higher rate than people who are part of what economists call the rentier class, making money off of other people's labor? Why is that? Why don't we have a lively conversation about that? Many Christians are upset about the percentage of what we pay in taxes that goes to making war. And some of them are war tax resistors. That's the phrase, war tax resistors. They resist paying taxes. They refuse to pay taxes. They will not pay taxes on um, the portion of their, uh, of their tax, of their tax of their, that goes to support the military. They refuse to do that, and um, they will instead donate that money to a peace tax fund or maybe a nonprofit organization that's working for peace, say like Mennonite Central Committee. And you might be surprised to learn that the government doesn't like that, and that they will actually uh, gain, gain access to the, to the uh, savings accounts of people and, and actually extract money from them. Taxes are controversial. And, and the other layer of taxes isn't just, isn't just who's paying taxes and how much, but the process by which we decide uh, how we're going to spend our tax dollars, uh, the process by which we decide who gets taxed 
and how much. One of the things that irks me a lot is the, the subsidy, the amount of tax dollars that go into propping up the fossil fuel industry. This is an industry that pollutes our air, negative externalities in economic language, pollutes our air and puts our uh, planet in peril. Yet we, as taxpayers, support this. What's going on here? Who's writing tax policy? Is corporate, are corporate lobbyists writing our tax policy? Anyway, I don't know if you can get riled up about these things, but I can get riled up about these things. And again, if you're, if you're bored and just looking for a lively conversation, start talking about tax policy with people. It'll liven things up, I guarantee you. Our text this morning, at a certain level, is about taxes. It is about tax policy. And, and, and the context and the, the, the community in which Jesus told this story, people are, are, are riled up about taxes. They, they, they get upset about it. So if you want to upset people in first century Palestine, talk about taxes. That'll get people riled up. And Jesus talks about taxes in this story. And taxes worked uh, uh, quite a bit differently, um, uh, in some ways very similar, but in some ways quite a bit differently in those days than, than they do in our time, in our place. So the tax collector that's mentioned in the text could be one of three different kinds of people, and they're very different kinds of people. And, and each, you, you, you don't quite know who the kind of person Jesus had in mind. But the Roman Empire occupied uh, Palestine, and it was an empire. And one of the things that empires uh, do, the whole point of being an empire is that you, it's about money, right? It's about wealth. It's about extracting wealth from the places that you conquer. You conquer places. Why do you conquer places? Just for the fun of it? No. You conquer places because you're greedy and you want wealth. And so one of the ways, if, you're a, if you are an occupying, conquering um, empire, like the Roman Empire was, is you tax people. You tax, you tax the populace. The commercial activity, the land, um, even just sort, of, just sort of living and breathing and being. You, you had to pay taxes. And the Romans had a system of taxation. They would outsource, they would outsource uh, their, uh, their tax system, their tax collectors, they would outsource it to people from the communities that they had conquered. And so you had, you had them essentially uh, making a contract, a contract with a tax collector. They would, the tax collector would say, okay, I'd like to, I'd like to have this contract to collect, to collect this tax. Maybe it's a tax, uh, maybe it's a, a tax on commercial activity of a particular product. I'm gonna, I'm gonna contract to collect this tax. Or maybe you are a tax farmer, like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector who had a whole network of tax collectors working for him. And that's why he was so wealthy. He wasn't just a two-bit tax collector, he was a he was a chief tax collector who had any number of people working for him as tax collectors, and he got a cut in all of it. Or maybe you had, uh, maybe you were an employee of somebody like Zacchaeus, who was paid a wage to collect a tax. The entire system, the entire system was, was built on corruption. So why would you want to be a tax collector? What, was, what is the point of being a tax collector? Why would you want to work for the Romans to be a tax collector. Because you get to take money from people legally. That's a pretty good deal. And you can, and, and so the assumption was on the part of the Romans is that these tax collectors would take more than the tax. They would, they would take a cut. Uh, it was corrupt. Um, you, you go back to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, John the Baptist condemns corruption, and, and tax collectors have come out to him to be baptized. And they ask him, well, what should we do? And he tells them, don't take more than what you're supposed to take. Well, the problem with that is the entire system is based on them taking more. There is no point to being a tax collector if you're not corrupt, if you're not extorting money uh, um, from, the, from the people from whom you're, whom you're collecting. Why would you want to be a tax collector? There's no point to it. The, 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 the entire premise is 
is, is corruption. So you look at the tax collector that Jesus puts before us, and you see an unjust person. If you, you see a social injustice warrior. He is working against justice actively. He is supporting the occupation of Palestine by the Roman Empire. Where do those taxes go? Remember we talked, there's not just who pays taxes and how much, of where does the money go? It goes to support an army. An army that's oppressive, an army that's extractive, an army that supports a political system and an economic system that oppresses the people. A tax collector is complicit in injustice by his very nature. And then you also have the Pharisee. Now we are programmed because of centuries of Christian interpretation of these texts to think of the Pharisee as a smug, a smug, um, self-absorbed kind of person. We need to rethink that. The Pharisee was a just person. The Pharisee was concerned about justice, about treating his neighbor well. The Pharisee might have been a war tax resistor. You had war tax resistors. They didn't quite call them that, but they were tax resistors. And in first century Palestine. Um, people from the community who would say, we're not going to pay the tax. We are resisting the Roman occupation by not paying the tax. The tax by itself is unjust. It's quite possible the Pharisee was a tax resistor that refused to support the army by pay paying taxes. Indeed, maybe, possibly, the Pharisees so upset by the presence of the tax collector in the temple, it's, it's because um, the tax collector and the Pharisee have a, have a, are, are personally at odds. The tax collector is an agent of injustice and the Pharisee is an agent of justice, loving God, loving neighbor. To the nth degree, generous, hosting meals in the home. I like Pharisees. The more I learn about Pharisees, the more I study about Pharisees in the time of Jesus, the more I like them. The more I think that they are good people. Now these two men are gathered in the temple. What is, what is the temple? The temple is the seat of God's presence, the mercy seat, the place where people went to encounter God and to receive God's mercy. It's uh, expected, uh, I always imagined this as a child, I imagined that the Pharisee and the tax collector were the only two people in the temple, but, but that, that wouldn't be right. There were probably a whole, a whole host of people in the temple that were present in the temple, a whole, uh, many of them. And notice that they, they both stand off. The Pharisee stands apart, and the tax collector stands far off and doesn't even look to heaven. But they are both part of the community, and they are both coming into the presence of God with a different kind of spirit. Now, if you are listening to this, if you are part of Jesus' original audience, you, do, you are, the tax collector makes you mad. The tax collector is the worst kind of person. And when you hear this story, and when you hear the tax collector not looking up to heaven, beating his breast in repentance, you think to yourself, yeah, right, give me a break, like that'll take. Show me, show, show me some fruits here. You know them by their fruits. Okay, that's great. Yeah, so the tax collector goes into the temple and, and, and wants repentance. But I don't buy it. I'm not buying it. You are rightly suspicious of this tax collector. Rightly so. And rightly sympathetic with the Pharisee. Who would be sympathetic with a tax collector? Are you kidding me? Rightly sympathetic with the Pharisee. But Jesus flips the story. And Jesus says, 
even the tax collector in a very different way than the Pharisee says, even this tax collector here. Even the tax collector receives grace. And the Pharisee, no matter how good, as a matter of obligation, as a matter of following the law, must love even the tax collector. Now, in, in our time, we receive this text, and uh, we place ourselves in the text. One of the things, one of the things that's intriguing about parables and I, why Jesus used them, uses them is that we place ourselves in, in the text. We identify with, at some level or another, with one of the characters in the text. It, it, I mean, it's an interesting sort of dynamic um, when you have a story. Part of the power of a story is you identify with the character in the story. Who do you identify with? Is there somebody that you identify with? Somebody you connect with? Think, oh, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I can identify with those feelings. I can be sympathetic with that, with that character. And for most of us, it's all of them, right, to at one point or another. Some of us are, some of us have days where we feel like the tax collector, where we feel we are bad, that we are unworthy, that we are unjust, and we bear that burden in prayer. Yet other days we are, we are smug, we are self-righteous, we are we are angry with the tax collector and unable to show the tax collector love and grace. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, talked about strength to love, strength to love, even the tax collector even the tax collector, even those who were enemies, even those who were behaving unjustly, even those who were committed to injustice, strength to love. That's a hard ask. It's a hard ask to love people who've done wrong, to love people who are doing wrong to love people who continue to do wrong. In our world today, in our, in our society, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of anger. A lot of anger. And there are reasons why that is, and I'm not going to analyze why there's so much, so much anger. But we find it very hard to love people who aren't like us, to extend grace, to extend mercy. That doesn't mean that we accept injustice or that we don't hold people accountable, but it means that we don't stop loving people. God's grace extends to even the tax collector. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Let's, respond to Phil. let's respond to Phil's words with Voices Together, number 163, Amazing Grace. We will sing verse 1 in English and then verse 1 in Spanish before singing verse 2.
I invite you now to bring your tithes and your offerings forward to God, not to earn a status of righteousness, but as an act of gratitude for all that God has done for you and for us. You can give online at collegemennonite.org or bring your offerings forward here to the baskets up front. Give God your best with a glad and joyful heart. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your mercy, for your grace. We give you thanks that we cannot flee from your presence, that wherever we might go, whether it's in body or in our spirits, our souls, we can't hide from you, and we can't hide from your love. We thank you that even when we are like the tax collector, burdened down with guilt and with shame, you love us. We thank you that even when we have a hard time loving the tax collector, you are with us, upholding us, giving us strength. We thank you that there is no end to your mercy. And so, as an act of worship, we return these gifts to you in love and thanksgiving. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
May Jesus Christ, who encourages the sinner and disturbs the righteous, free us from our sin and self-righteousness. Give us realistic eyes to see our place in the world and direct us into actions of compassion and peace. Amen.